yeah, I'm really sad as well, really sad image. Imagine if this image wasn't there, then people wouldn't potentially be resonating as much. Conversations that happen here may govern future wars and may have governed past wars. This just sounds mad. This one's called Nothing Personal, The Back Office of War. Now this is probably one of the most strange and different pictures that I've seen out of the, the six that I'll be looking at today. I already know a little bit of the context behind the picture, but that guy who's in the grey suit and he's walking through the door, I, I don't know where this is. It's such a weird building. But anyway, I'll get to that in a second. I'm getting ahead of myself. But he's holding a rocket. Um, and he's holding it whilst wearing a grey suit, nice suit, and he's walking through the door. It's just a sur such a surreal image. I think what's also cool about it is all, it's kind of cubist, the way all the lines kind of intersect and the colours. It kind of, it could almost be like an abstract piece of art if you kind of squinted your eyes and you took out the, the details of the image. It does look a bit cubist. But it's just so strange because you, you're looking at him and he's there and he's holding a friggin' bazooka and he's just walking past. What also is interesting is you've got that hand that's kind of floating in the air there with the other hand and it's looking at a phone. So someone behind that wall is idly looking at their phone and that guy whose head, whose eyes you don't see, so his identity is kind of concealed, which adds an air of like eeriness to it. And he walks through that door and then that guy might come through, but it's just very weird. I know what this is actually about already because I read an article briefly about this and the work that Nikita's been doing. And essentially, this is an expo for people that want to buy new weapons. Innovations in weapons, tanks, stab vests, guns, bazookas, rockets, jets, all that. And these people go on the behalf of these weapons companies and they go and bid and basically do a meet and greet, shake hands and do some networking so that they can buy more human killing bombs and shit. It's, it's mad, it is such a weird and surreal photograph. And what adds to it is the flash as well. There's something about flashes that makes it like feel candid and real, but also like some, someone's been caught in the act of it. But it's also like really like, I don't know, it just feels like dirty. I can't explain it, it just feels dirty, like the sheen on stuff you can see, like, you know, the imperfections and things, how things aren't clean, and, you know, this is not clean, like, I don't know how these people have clean consciences going out and buying weapons and things, and that eventually are going to kill people. 18th of February, 2019. A businessman locks away a pair of anti-tank grenade launchers at the end of an exhibition day at the International Defence Exhibition and Conference, IDX, in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates, on the 18th of February. IDEX is the biggest defence exhibition and conference in the Middle East, and one of the biggest arms trade fairs in the world. No official attendance figures are released, but according to UAE state media, the event drew 1,200 global defence specialists, 1,300 exhibitors, and more than 105,000 visitors. Attendees include defence ministers, military chiefs of staff, and key government decision makers who interact in conference halls, social events, and back office meetings. War is staged in an artificial environment, where mannequins and screen images take the place of real people, and with outdoor demonstrations and daily choreographed battle displays on water. This just sounds mad, like, it just sounds crazy that there's people that literally go like I'd go to like an anime convention or a comic convention, but for guns, and then they'd go and have like off the radar, off the record meetings, like conversations that happen here may have governed, may govern future wars and may have governed past wars, potentially, and I just think as, because we're talking about media and, and investigative journalism here, this is not, you know, Pamela Anderson did this, or, oh look, Ben Affleck and Anna de Armes were snogging on a beach. This is about power, because they call it the fourth estate for a reason. It's the watchdog of power. That's what journalism is supposed to do. I mean, from my education anyway. And I think it's really interesting, looking at power and... Yeah, this is this is really good stuff. I wish this was bigger. I wish more people were 
engaging with this. I mean, that's why I'm making this video. The title is Relative Mourns Flight ET-302 Crash Victim. So, you kind of get the context there. I already know that this is about the Ethiopian plane crash that happened and killed a lot of people. This is, yeah, this is a really sad scene. You've got the two women, they're dressed in black, and I, I don't know if that's because it's a funeral. She's throwing ashes onto her face, or it could be dirt at the actual site. Why I think this has been nominated is because, one, the context, and two, because of the expression. I mean, you already know that the lady who's throwing the ashes on her face is absolutely distraught. You can see in the tension in the neck and the, the muscles in her neck contracting because of the grief. You kind of got her going to comfort her at the same time. I think the, the dress is really interesting. And I mean, I'm trying to be authentic and give you my honest reactions to this. Like, this is just a very, really sad image. And if you sit with it for a while and you kind of look at the details and talk about it and really sit with it, it can get, it can, it can get you emotional. I mean, I get emotional. 14th of March 2019, a relative of a victim of the crash of Ethiopian Airlines flight ET302 throws dirt in her face as she mourns at the crash site on the 14th of March. The force of the impact made human remains difficult to identify. On the 10th of March, Ethiopian Airlines flight ET302, a Boeing 737 MAX, disappeared from the radar six minutes after takeoff from Addis Ababa Airport and crashed into a field, killing all 157 people on board. The impact was so great that both engines were buried in a crater 10 metres deep, and human remains almost impossible to identify. On the 14th of November, eight months after the crash, the site of the impact was covered, and the unidentified remains of victims buried in rows of identical coffins. Comparisons were made with the crash of a Lion Air aircraft, also a 737 MAX, 12 minutes after takeoff from Jakarta Airport in October 2018. Countries across the world, initially with the exception of the US, grounded the 737 MAX. First reports showed that pilots had been unable to prevent the plane reportedly nosediving despite following procedures recommended by Boeing. It appeared that in both cases, pilots were struggling to deal with an automated safety system designed to prevent stalling which was repeatedly pushing the nose of the plane down. It seemed that the system was being activated, possibly due to a faulty sensor, even though nothing was wrong. It later emerged that American Airlines pilots had confronted Boeing about potential safety issues with the MAX. Boeing had resisted their calls, but promised a software fix, which had not been done by the time flight ET-302 crashed. Planes remained grounded in early 2020. Boeing expected the crisis to cost 18.6 billion US dollars and CEO Dennis Moylenberg was fired. When you read the descriptions about how the people, the impact of the plane hitting the ground, like both engines were 10 meters deep, which is huge. I'm just looking at my door in this room now and imagine, you know, that's five times that. So it's, it's like a two story building, like, um, you know, a big house being a whole engine just going that that deep it's just immense and the fact that you know remains couldn't have even been found because of how hard the plane hit the earth and it just makes you think about how terrifying an experience it must have been to be on that plane to be the pilot to be the passengers and this again is only one image you know about one family there's of 157 people that died on it and I think, you know, imagine if this image wasn't there, then people wouldn't potentially be resonating as much because people, you know, they, we're, we're visual creatures, humans. We use sight a lot. And when you see an image like this, it's hard not to respond. When Notre Dame burnt down and everyone was going crying about it, billions from billionaires had been flown, you know, and cashing in to help them. But when things like this happen, you know, someone's fired and, you know, yes, Someone was fired, and yes, they have to pay a lot, like it costs them a lot, but that isn't going to bring the lives back of these people. And I don't know if the world really mourns or has mourned as much for this as they have for similar, similar incidents. So I think as a moment that the photographer caught, unlike, say, 
you know, the previous one by Nikita, that was taken and she was taking it and she might not have been do, supposed to do that. And it adds to the air of mystery because the guy's head was cut off. Where the previous ones with the the girl who was comatose, he were that could have been staged for all I know. The other ones, which the protest picture, that would have been very hard to get because it's within the action. And But there's a lot of people, so you know where to go for the action. And same with the one uh, by Yasuyoshi. Again, like, if the kids start singing, you go there. It's pretty symmetrical. Where this, from the other pictures that I've briefly seen, there's a lot going on. So for the photographer who's called Mulligetta Ayane to go and get that picture in such definition and pick them out. And at that moment, like, I'd love to see the stills of, you know, the her throwing the... Because there, there, there was a you know, a clear process of picking that image out. But I think just to say that they actually got that image at the end and to be that close to something that's so personal is really commendable. And, the say, and I would say the same as well for the one by Ivor Prickett for the Kurdish fighter. To be able to get so close to these such personal and very dangerous topics and situations that, you know, end up killing people, a lot of people at the end of the day, is really commendable. I, I think that photojournalists have to be commended on the work that they do and there needs to be more discussion and elevation of what they do because the work that they do is amazing and I think more people need to be appreciative of the work they do generally. I'm not just talking within the art world or photography world or media world, I mean generally. So I hope that this video hasn't been too depressing. I hope that you've learned something I hope that you've come away with a new understanding of certain topics and appreciation of things. And I implore you to go to the website, have a look for yourself and go to any of the exhibitions and galleries that are holding these pictures and read the work that these guys are putting out there because it truly is amazing and hopefully it will change people's lives, even if it's just a small way. Anyway, hopefully you enjoyed that video. Please let me know if you did by giving me a like. If you didn't enjoy it and you thought I rambled too much, please thumbs down. In the comments, let me know which was your favorite picture of the six and why. And if you have any recommendations of the videos that I should do, then please let me know. Don't hesitate. I'll be in the comments. And hope you have a good evening. My name is Sam Mikhail North. Keep it cool. I'll see you next time.